Oh my God, we're live, we're live. Can someone in the chat bar acknowledge the fact that we are live? It's worked, I think it's worked. Great. Great, we're live. Um, listen, uh, it's impossible to, to, to uh, host this event today. I know, holy crap boss, I did it. Are you proud? Um, it's impossible to to kick off this with uh, without acknowledging the fact that this is our second attempt uh, at hosting a, a, an ESG debate on home games. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, last year uh, we we kind of collectively at the Landcat got tired of. Uh, traveling down to England. I mean, England's fine and all that. It's a, it's a beautiful place. But uh, we got tired of traveling to, to England to, to all the conferences that we're on. So we decided to host our own uh, conference up in Scotland uh, called Home Games. It was a, a great success up in Edinburgh. And we thought, yeah, we'll, we'll do that again this year. Uh, wouldn't that be a great thing to do? Um, we all know what's happened in, in the interim. Uh, coronavirus has, has put paid to absolutely everything in the sector over the last three to four months. Uh, so we decided to, to take it on the virtual road uh, and home games. One worked fine, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, all the way to 15 or 16 worked absolutely fine. Uh, we also hosted, uh, I did various round tables uh, and insight playbacks on Crowdcast. Uh, we did, uh, we've launched a, a tool this year, Platform Analyzer, uh, now with integrated pricing module, uh, that's marketing for you. Um, we've launched loads of user sessions on those and it worked absolutely bloody fine until I pressed the go live button on the ESG discussion two weeks ago and the computer said, no, nah, no, nah, not having it, not going live, you're not allowed. Um, we found out the next day that there was, a, there was some database uh, issue at Crowdcast End, which I think if you put into Google Translator, uh, that comes out as not Steve's fault, uh, which is uh, the, the only thing that matters in all of this, really. Um, the, the two people I want to say the biggest thank you for uh, are, of course, uh, on the screen at the moment because they gave up uh, some of their time two weeks ago uh, and they have very kindly agreed uh, to give up some of their time again today. Um, we'll go live to uh, Jeannie Boyle. Uh, Jeannie Boyle is uh, Executive Director of EQ Investors. She's also a Chartered Financial Planner. Um, Jeannie, hello, you're live. Hello. How are you doing and how has lockdown been for you? Well, it's, it's been an interesting few, few months. Um, well, I live by myself, so there's been some, some challenging times there, but it's been a, a brilliant way to, to see a little bit into the future and to um, adapt to some changes, interesting flexible working, enjoy more time at home. I live down in Brighton, so I'm very, very lucky to have a beach on my doorstep, which I'm very thankful for. But yeah, there's been some, some ups and downs. Glad to be getting towards the end of it, I think. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, I think we're all um, grateful that we're starting to maybe think like there's a there's an end in sight. I mean, it's been it's been great for many reasons. Um, we are also uh, very, very lucky to be joined uh, by Neville White. Now, Neville White is the head of responsible and sustainable research uh, at Eden Tree Investing. Uh, Neville, hello. Same question. How are you doing and how has lockdown been uh, for you? Hi everyone. I'm, I'm glad we've gone live and we've managed to make this work a second time. Um, yeah, we're all still in lockdown, so I'm speaking to you from home in Kent. Um, the whole of Eden Tree is still working from home with no real plans to go back. Uh, I went up to London uh, two days ago and it's just like a deserted wasteland, a zombie city. So but I think we're all good. We're all doing well and um, fascinating the way the business has just transitioned seamlessly to working from home. So uh it has been has some technological problems, but otherwise we're doing okay, I think. There's been no technological problems at all, Neville. That's not the thing to say today. <laughs> Let's not <laughs> have the technology. <laughs> uh, so yeah, just just to reiterate, we're so grateful that that you've decided to uh, give up some of your time for uh, the home games audience, uh, and thank you to uh, to the the many many of you who I can see are joining uh, as we speak. Um, a few bit of housekeeping um, bits and pieces before we get on to the main body uh, of today. Um, I want to see the chat bar full of questions uh, today. It's a really interesting topic, but it's a really varied 
uh, topic as well. It, it touches so many different aspects uh, of our sector and our day-to-day -day life uh, when we think about what it might mean today and what it might mean in the future. So I want to see loads of comment, uh, maybe kick off by by uh, giving us uh, a sentence or so about what ESG might mean to you, because uh, I've got a theory which I'm, I'm going to share with you in just two minutes. Um, I'm also going to share a link if any of you are having a uh, audio or video video uh, sorry issues i believe if you click that link and hit refresh uh, then it does something clever and fancy with buffering uh, so if there's a bit of a uh, delay or stuff's a little bit out of sync with with audio and video that might well sort you out uh, so that's that um a bit of housekeeping uh, i'm uh, speaking to you from Leafy Long Nidri, which is a, a lovely wee town just outside uh, East Lothian. Um, I live on a train line uh, just outside uh, the house is, is the East Coast uh, main line and it's a source of great amusement uh, among the many uh, phone calls and conferences and Zoom calls and Teams calls where uh, the train might well come battering past at any moment um, and I'll, I'll uh, stop talking if that happens and uh, maybe tell you which train it is just for interest. So if we've got anybody joining us who is a huge ESG enthusiast uh, and a train spotter then you're in for a great 40 minutes or so um, so that's that uh, t-shirt of the week um, if you're a, a regular uh, viewer you will know that uh, Mr Poulsen the gaffer likes to furnish us uh, with his uh, heavy metal listening uh, of the week there is no uh, heavy metal uh, in, the Nelson, in the Nelson household uh, mainly um, but T-shirt of the week uh, today is uh, the Samaritans. Um, uh, the Samaritans are a, a cause very close uh, to the hearts of the Landcat for various reasons. And, and uh, regular viewers and, and friends of the Landcat will know that we, we do a little bit of fundraising uh, every uh, now and again. Um, we're not asking you to, to go to a link or to donate anything in, in our name. But all we would say is that... Uh, Lockdown in particular has been, uh, you know, it's been all right for most of us because most of us uh, live in live in a, a privileged old life in financial services. But there's loads of people who are struggling and it's not made easier by being cooped up indoors uh, for extended uh, lengths of time. So if you enjoy the session and next time you see a Samaritan's tin, um, if you feel like minded to think of us and, and put in a couple of quid, uh, that would be absolutely super. This was a t-shirt I wore on the, the big walk that we did last year and it's a little bit tighter, <laughs> I have to say, um, given the old lockdown belly uh, that's been happening uh, over the past few months, although the camera does add uh, 10 pounds I hear uh, that they say, uh, and I've got one of those fancy new computers with five uh, webcams on it. Uh, so that's T-shirt of the week. We do have mug of the week as well, which is uh, a rather fetching. Louis through, got to get through this. That's because through sounds a bit like uh, through. Um, and the last bit of housekeeping is that you can watch all of these sessions uh, either via your Crowdcast link uh, or if you go onto YouTube, uh, the Lancat U YouTube channel, you can like and subscribe. I believe that's what your YouTubers say. Uh, to get people to, to to come and follow us and look at some of the old sessions. So you might well be watching a playback. Uh, hello to the future, uh, if you are. Uh, hopefully the future is better. Are we out of lockdown? Uh, who knows? Right, I think that's all the housekeeping. That was a ferocious amount of housekeeping there. Uh, we're going to get on to the main uh, body of the, the, the discussion today, which is ESG investing and what that means uh, in 2020. And I've got three topics of discussion that I would like to cover uh, with Jeannie and Neville today. Um, the first is definition. So how do we define this, this part of the market a bit better? Is it in need of uh, a bit better definition? Uh, the second thing is the notion of the individual and what that means in terms of mapping someone's individual beliefs and philosophies over to an investment portfolio or product, uh, for example. And the last thing I want to talk about is the notion of demand. Where is the demand in, in the sector for this? Is it advisor led? Is it consumer led? What will it be in the future? Is it just one big amorphous blob and we're not really sure what it is? Uh, has it has it grown arms and legs before it before it needs to? Um, so that's us for today. That's that's the agenda. And the first thing to do is to go back to uh, our guests. Uh, thank you again to, to Jeannie and Neville. Um, 
I like to think that there's a Mount Rushmore uh, of ESG investors, and we're blessed to have two of the four uh, individuals on that Mount Rushmore uh, today. I know, Jeannie, you're laughing at me like that's a, a ridiculous notion. It's a perfectly normal thing to say uh, on a webinar. So what I'd like to do is to go back to you, Jeannie, first of all, and tell us like what is because ESG means something very specific to you and your company. But what it, what what does that mean on a practical sense on a day to day basis? What 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 do you do? Okay, so there's there's a lot of definitions that we use in this space, and we're talking specifically today about ESG. So by ESG, when when I'm talking about it, and I think when other professionals are talking about it, we're talking about using publicly available data to measure. Um, any extra element of risk that a company poses to investors. Um, and that's something that's become a very popular way of investing. It's probably not quite what um, the end customer understands when they come to you asking for something like a sustainable portfolio or an environmental portfolio. So the, the other way that we look at things within our business is looking at impact and saying instead of measuring risk within a, within a company, understand what a company does is it a harmful and is it b helpful is it helping to solve an environmental or social pro problem that we face in the world so those are the two types of investments that we we tend to work with in this world so esg on one hand helping to understand risk metrics and trying to back the companies we think are going to do better um, and impact investing which is about looking mm -hmm. more depth at a product or a service okay and in terms of of in a practical sense, because you're uh, you're uh, 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 chiefly a financial advice firm, so you're you're delivering advice to clients. So, how does that impact their portfolios on a on a day to day basis? What what do they get in return for for transacting with you? We most of the clients that we work with are interested in something that goes a little bit beyond just screening out certain negative sectors. So, in practical terms, we look for opportunities in areas where we can match up a company with one of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So we're looking at things like clean energy, healthcare, uh, pollution control, access to education, good housing. And we're looking for the companies that we can say are contributing to those, those um, solutions. Um, okay. And what we find is that that kind of works with clients because clients come and clients are quite often thinking about things like, polar bears and main forest and clean air. Those are the things that the clients actually want. Um, but sometimes I think the fund management industry is looking very much at ESG uh, metrics. And the fund managers like things like risk measured returns and things that are popular with clients. And there's a bit of a mismatch at the moment between those two different ideas. Um, and I think that's uh, an area of potential risk. In this Grand. So we're going to we'll come back to that notion of, of what's kind of happening on the manufacturing side when we when we get onto the second um part of the chat and for any train spotters that was the uh 1245 lner uh, out of edinburgh that just went past right same question uh to neville um what does esg investing mean to to you on a day-to-day -day basis because you've you've got a very uh, specific specific role to play in this haven't you Yeah, I, th I think this is very much a who's Oh, we're losing Neville. We have a problem moment. The more compelling... ...attractive this market is... ...to the underlying investor, the more confused... Using, we're making it for them, and and I've always been uh, Neville, very just gonna, unhappy with it. Should I just stop you there? I know there's a big because delay. Lumps, but, uh, you're coming in and out pretty significantly. I'm, I'm together. Uh, maybe just speaking for myself here, but uh, three maybe. concepts which clearly are not necessarily lumpable. Uh, Neville's coming in and out. I don't think you can hear me. No. No, I think what I can hear you. Yeah, you can hear me. Okay. Yeah. Um. You. I was just saying, Neville, that the we've we've tempted the tech gods 
um, and you are coming in and out pretty significantly. Now, what Crowdcast does is it should boot off your video so that the audio uh, compensates for this, and, and we, we should be able to hear you a little bit clearer now. So uh, again, sorry to the, the, the audience for, for, for tuning in here, but uh, could, you, could we maybe have another stab at that question? Because um, we only caught about 10% uh, of that there, mate. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, I was saying we 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 have a, we have a problem. The more compelling and authentic this part of the market is to the underlying investor, the more complicated we're making it for them. And I think ESG is a really sterile term um, that really speaks inwardly to the industry and doesn't look outward to to the underlying investor and their needs. If you think back in the beginning, there was ethical investment, and everybody understood what that was. And that sort of morphed in the early noughties to SRI. And what has fascinated me is the way that SRI has now completely disappeared. And yet the R in SRI was about responsibility. And so for us at Eden Tree, you know, we're responsible and sustainable investors. And we really believe passionately in the ethics of business and making business better. So it's almost like the old fashioned two-sided coin of corporate responsibility and, and and responsible investment. I think ESG does make it really hard for, um, for the underlying investor to understand that. Yeah, and, and of course, um, sorry, Neville, that, that, that was uh, coming through loud and clear there uh, as, as Craig has to, uh, decided to take action and turn your video off there. So, so that's great. Thank you very much for that. Um, so I, I guess that this takes us quite nicely onto my first kind of difficult question for you both uh in that there's an elephant in the room uh and that is the boohoo question i think and it's it's incumbent on us to ask that and to front that up um so i'm sure most people who are tuning in today will have will have caught wind of this in the news um uh, but Boohoo are a, an organisation who uh, manufacture clothing range and it has come to light uh, that some of their working conditions uh, have been uh, viewed as less than favourable, uh, shall we say, and, and resembling uh, conditions uh, akin to uh, some of the, the kind of unsavoury tales we hear about sweatshops and, and stuff abroad. Um, but also, uh, we've seen uh, reports, particularly in the FT, the FT uh, articles probably gained the biggest uh, amount of traction, where uh, Boohoo itself as a stock has made its way onto uh, a number of uh, so-called ethical or sustainable fund ranges or portfolios or holdings. Um, now, it's it's really easy for, for someone like me at the Lancat who you know, doesn't have skin in the game and, and doesn't work in the, the either the manufacturing or the processing or the, the specific research and, and to throw mud at this and say, well, that's clearly broken then, isn't it? You know, what, what the hell is going on? But I wonder if we could have a chat about the, the, like the practicalities. How does that happen? How is that allowed to happen? Are we getting, is it a, a, is it a fault in the research process? Is it a fault in the manufacturing process? Jeannie, if I could come to you first, yeah. what do you think of the boohoo issue? So I think um, you know, ESG, um, I think Neville and I agree, is, is setting the bar pretty low. The environmental social governance, it can mean pretty much anything. And it's not always clear how, how firms are measured on those criteria. Um, I think there are, there are, most people are now using data that's supplied by the company itself to, to screen these companies. Um, so you're relying on what the company is telling you. Uh, first of all, you're not actually doing any underlying analysis of that business um, to understand what their working practices are. So that's how a company like Boohoo gets into a portfolio. I mean, the, the, the sweatshops in Leicester have been common knowledge for, for a few years. I remember reading a report in, I think it was the Sunday Times, a couple, maybe a year or so ago. People knew about this. But because no one was going that extra mile to do the research, um, Boohoo were rated as good because they had a UK supply chain, whereas it's it's kind of obvious the clothes they sell are so cheap. How can they be produced in the UK at that cost? It's simply not possible. So, and I think the second point is most end customers would be really disappointed to find a stock like that in, in their portfolio anyway. Um, fast fashion, well, the fashion industry generally is responsible for 10% of global carbon emissions. It's hugely polluting. It's doing nothing to create a more sustainable world. Uh, and that type of stock just doesn't belong in any portfolio that claims to be environmental. 
Uh, and the, the issue that I go back to, this is going to disappoint people who will then lose faith in financial services and its ability to deliver what they said they will deliver. Yeah, um, I, I get that. And I think that there's a there's an uncomfortable truth here. And, and you touched on it there, Jeannie, about this being, you know, depending on how hard you want to look at it, it's common knowledge. Mm -hmm. And there's also, I mean, we, we, talk, we, we think about other aspects of day to day life where we, you know, we maybe go on, on social media or Twitter or whatever and talk about or complain about something or, or maybe, you know, get involved in a bit of virtue signaling. And I think, you know, we've all been there, myself included, whilst typing on an iPhone, you know, and, and you know, we're, you, we all filter out the things that matter to us at, at the time, you know, and close our eyes on, on other stuff. Um, kind of same question to, to you, Neville, and I mean, um, given given your job title, um, I feel like I'm putting you on a pedestal here as the, the head of responsible research. How do you make sure your research is responsible uh, in the context of, of, of some things that can go wrong uh, like this? Yeah, it's absolutely core to what you do if you're going to present yourself as a responsible and sustainable investor. I guess the first thing to say is, you know, what keeps me awake at night it's what could blow up in the portfolios that we don't know about. And I think it's important that everybody understands that no company is perfect. All companies will have a blow up. Um, Nestle has been very candid in saying it has child labor and traffic labor in its supply chain in Southeast Asia. It's then about what is the company doing to mitigate and to improve that. So we know that nothing is perfect. But let's take the G. You know, I, I mentioned about lumping ES and G together. Boohoo continues to, to hide on the alternative investment market. It's a company which would be a very sizable mid cap if it was on the premium listing, but it hides on AIM. You know the governance is poor and they're on AIM for a particular reason. That should already signal alarm bells. And it was instructive that in the same week as, as the labor story broke, they were going to pay themselves the three executive managers 150 million in share options, uh, which weren't even going to go to shareholders for a vote because on AIM they don't need to. So there are alarm bells all around a company like Boohoo. And quite honestly, I think what we would say is um, defining sustainability is one of the problems similar to ESG, but there is no way that you can call a pure fast fashion model sustainable. It creates waste, it creates low paid employment, and contracted out to chase the lowest possible denominator. I think it's possible to do that relatively responsible. If you want that market, you might look at Primark, for instance. You know Primark is doing the same thing, but they will have the resources to monitor and do the audits to, in, to ensure the, you know, the labor conditions are as best as they can be. I think I mean, it's for other managers to say why they held Boohoo. But I think at the core of this is a reliance on ESG ratings, which are generally poor, and a failure to do really quality in-house human research rather than using an algorithm. Yeah. Um, yeah just to make a, a, another point on that. I think over the past few years, we've seen a huge focus, uh, quite rightly, on, on cost um, and the cost of fund management. Um, and there's been a huge uh, drive towards using passive investment solutions. Um, and that is hard to marry up with uh, portfolios that do a really good job of screening out the worst companies and then targeting those who are who are doing well on an environmental focus. If you are if you're looking at industries that are using ESG ratings, that is they are they are not simply doing enough research. As Neville says, they're, they've not got the boots on the ground. They're not able to understand what's going on at that company. And sometimes I think we need to have a more of a conversation about uh, value. Uh, and the value that's provided by active fund management, particularly in this, this type of investing. And there's a kind of arrogance as well, Steve, in I think most of the ratings agencies gave Boohoo a premium because they sourced in the UK. And I think what we've realized was we mustn't be arrogant about our own standards. I mean, we have a minimum wage, we have a national living wage, but clearly things are still going wrong in the, in the Leicester industry. And just because something is in Bangladesh, actually the quality could be higher in terms of labor conditions and rights because of all of the audits that have been done successively over time. Whereas we take this complacent idea that as long as they source from the UK, it's okay. I think Boohoo really has made a, a wake up call about the UK standards that are not being enforced by gangmasters, by other regulatory bodies in the UK. 
I think th those are all really good points. Um, we've had a couple of questions come in, uh, one from Andy and one from Norman, and they're both really good. And we're going to touch on, I'll come back to them, because we're going to touch on them in, in the second part of the discussion. Just wanted to close off this 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 uh, notion of definition um, with a, a thought that came to mind. Because we had, we had a question actually sent in in advance uh, from someone who couldn't uh, attend today. Um, and a lot of what I'm hearing from you both is, is about the notion of, um, I don't know if screening is the right word, but a research process which allows you to invest um, for the positive, for, for either positive impact or, or sustainable impact for uh, the investor and for wider society. Um, is there a counter, and this is a question, is there a counterpoint that in some instances it's better to be on the inside? Um, exerting some kind of influence. So, being a, a, a stockholder in a, uh, for example, the the oil industry or, or or fashion industry or whatever, and exerting a, a level of control. So, better being on on the inside, trying to influence. Or is that a is that a, a hopelessly optimistic notion? Maybe come to you first, Jeannie. Um, I think in, in some cases that can work really well and there have been some fantastic examples of fund manager engagement with businesses to improve practices. But then you can contrast that with looking at, um, I think, for example, BlackRock's voting record, which is quite frankly appalling when it comes to supporting environmental change. Um, and that's, that's, that's a fund management group that's uh, been very proactive in talking about their ESG uh, ranges. Um, it's, too often it's simply not happening. Grand. Neville, do you have anything to add to that or, or shall we move on to part two? Sorry, Steve, you were coming in and out. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, when our model isn't, isn't to go in specifically with the idea of turning a company around. We screen um, really proactively to ensure that we invest in the best companies for the long term on a responsible and sustainable approach. But I think where you have something blow up, I mean, a good example from, from Eden Tree's experience is we decided to stick with Novartis, which went through a really torrid time of controversies and fraud. Um, and we stuck with them and actually had a really, really good engagement process, which ended up with me recording a video for them, which was said, shown to their top 500 managers around the world because the CEO really wanted to enforce a new culture on the company and actually getting that investor support was really important. Equally, we divested from a company like Johnson & Johnson because we just felt that the 120,000 court cases pending in that company around product governance, corruption, fraud and lots of other issues just meant that it, it, it didn't, it no longer satisfied the standards we had. So I think you take a, a case by case approach really. Grand. Thanks for that. Um, thanks for that, Neville. Right, we will move on because time is absolutely flying by, as expected, um, to the second part of the discussion, which for me is the notion of the individual. Um, now, for many reasons within the sector, it seems to me like we've got ourselves to a point where um, the, the majority of investment decisions and investment processes are industrialised. To, to a certain degree, when we do our regular omnibus research, we uh, consistently find out that over 80% of our firms are using a centralised investment process. Um, that's either driven by in-sourced models uh, via platform architecture and uh, you know risk profiling tools and, and what have you, or outsourced to a discretionary range or a multi-manager or, or multi-manager uh, or multi-asset range. Um, from a business perspective, that makes good commercial sense because it promotes a one-to-many relationship where you can uh, transact on a, on a repeatable and consistent outcome basis and it frees you up to um, carry out the discipline of financial planning and focus on, on what you might believe defines you better as a firm. Um, but the notion of ESG investing or ethical investing or SRI investing or however we might want to define it in the future, to me that presents a bit of a problem. Uh, for us um, because, uh, and I'll come to you first, Jeannie. So if I come to you as a uh, you know, guardian reading, couscous eating, liberal, left-leaning snowflake. Um, big <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, unhelpful, potentially offensive stereotypes aside. But if I come to you with my ethics and my beliefs, um, how do I then get matched to a, a solution that will satisfy me? And is that even the role 
of you as a planner or us as a wider sector? Should that be the end game uh, in the context of, of ESG? And that's a big question. Yeah, I think I think it is absolutely our responsibility. I think talking to clients about their, their values and their beliefs is, is absolutely core to what we're doing. So, um, if you're starting a financial planning relationship, you know, I want to know everything about you. I want to, I want to understand what makes you tick because that's how I can help you plan a, a good life. Um, and the investment decisions around your, your ethics are, are crucial to that. So I would want to understand what exactly you were looking for, were there any particular areas you wanted to concentrate or anything that was particularly offensive to you. Um, the honest answer is most of our clients use our, our pre-selected um, group of funds, which screen out the things that sort of 90% of people who are interested in this space are happy to screen out, which are tobacco arms, fossil fuels, um, and various other things, and look for the positive things. But we, we can take slightly different approach um, and try and accommodate some some investment criteria, but there are some things that are difficult for us. To, um, it's very difficult if people are, you know, if you're a very committed vegan who doesn't want to have any animal testing whatsoever, it's, it's hard for us to accommodate that. Um, we would try, but there's there's an additional cost involved with that additional work. And I know we've talked in the past about you know, the potential for AI to do some of that work, which I think could be quite an exciting way to start yep. with portfolios. I think the thing we have to be conscious of as planners is that sometimes people's better intentions um, run away with them. I've sat down with clients who've, who've said to me, well, if I take more risk with my portfolio, will I have a, a better impact on the world? And that, that, you know, it's kind of lovely to hear that, but no, please don't do that. Please, please have a, a risk portfolio. People, I, I've worked with clients who would happily have invested every penny they had in renewable energy projects. Uh, but it's it's, it's our, our job really to help them understand why diversification is important to, in all of this. So I think sometimes, yes, we have to work with individuals and their, their needs, but sometimes we have to have to maybe temper their uh, their requirements a little bit. That makes a lot of sense. Um, Neville, I just want to come back to um, a question that was in the chat bar there, because I think uh, you're the man to ask. Um, Andy Schleider, uh, hi Andy, a regular viewer of uh, Home Games, how are you doing? Um, in the early days when a client brought, brought up an interest in ethical investing, the question used to be, do you want to invest ethically or do you want a return? How have things changed since then in terms of returns and fund range? Because of course there is the, que the perpetual question, is there an ethical premium? Uh, on on a potential return because in theory you are potentially narrowing the the investment universe. So does that exist? What's your view? Are are you giving up potential pounds in your in your retirement for investing ethically? Uh, and I think the answer is partly linked to the question that Michelle has asked as well. Back when that question was always posed, it will cost you money. I think it was because there were very limited number of products and the focus was very much on on avoidance. If you like the positive aspect of ESG is that it has downplayed avoiding whole categories of industry and activity and trying to invest in positive outcomes um, in, in Jeannie's kind of world, you know, the impact essence, the sustainability. Um, and Michelle makes the point that it, investors are now chasing a small pot of what are perceived to be sustainable stocks, and that is creating a bubble. But I think the the whole debate around will it cost you money has gone, partly because the direction of travel for the world in general is to make us more carbon light, more resource efficient, all of the things that will drive investment uh, and capital um, expenditure by companies. So I think you know that debate has moved on a lot. The problem um, though is, is what you touched on, Steve, is the price pressure on the fund management industry really creates the kind of boohoo situation because ultimately if, if we cannot actually charge a realistic price for a very human activity, and I'm a team of three that does everything, voting, all the engagement, all of the screening, we don't yeah. use algorithms, we don't use quants, um, it's, an expense, you know, it's an expensive activity um, and I think there's going to be some pinch points there. And only yeah. using you know, ratings and algorithms will ultimately lead, I think, potentially to boohoo type outcomes in your portfolio because it's you need the human intervention. I think the, I think you're right. I think that's the worry. Um, we've had a really good question in from uh, Ben Peel. Um, ben Peel isn't a pseudonym for me um, because it, 
the reason I'm saying that is uh, it was my next question on my list. To, we're mind melding here, Ben. Um, but I wanted to come to Jeannie to talk about um, the upcoming regulatory requirements about including uh, an ESG consideration uh, in your discussion with clients. Now, clearly, uh, as EQ investors, you're uh, well suited up uh, to, to, to do uh, that kind of thing. But there was another question that we got sent in in advance uh, around uh, how do you even ask or, or, or frame that correctly in a discussion with a client so that you're not leading the witness? Because how many people, if you were to pose, and I'm not suggesting people are going to do this, but a very simple terms, if you were to ask 100 people, do you want to invest for a more sustainable future? And do you want your investments to do better things for the world? Then I'm pretty sure loads of people are going to say yes, because it's largely self-evident if most of us are, are would like to believe that we're altruistic at, at heart. But in, in a practical sense, Jeannie, what, what's this going to mean and how... How tooled up do you think the, the the advice sector is for for this? I think I think there's um there's a range of different states of readiness amongst the advice sector, and I think asking the question is really important. I mean, to me, if 100 people say yes, I want to invest sustainably, that's bloody brilliant. I mean, that's <laughs> that's <laughs> how we're going to help the world get into a better state. So yeah, maybe you are leading the witness, but um, I think. Just, just get used to doing it. Asking people other things you want to exclude. Are you, you know, are you interested in um, in the environment? But there are other things that you can talk about about charities that people give to, which would be a normal part of your fact finding process. You, you, know, you might touch on things like you know recycling changes people are making in their lives. When people start talking about their grandchildren, they they will often start talking about the world that they they are going to be living in. Uh, and the reality is now for most grandparents, their grandchildren are going to grow up in a very, very different world. And people are, are waking up to the idea that they can do something to change that, um, to, to offset some of the damage that's been caused over the last 100 years. So I think once you start asking the questions, people are very open about what they, what they want and what they want to see change. Um, I think what's really crucial is how you then react to that information. Um, I think if you if you've got a client sitting in front of you saying yes, I'm really interested in um, you know I'm, I'm I'm really concerned about climate change, and then you give them your portfolio that's um, stuff full of oil companies um, because you don't think that environmental investing is, is right, then that's where the situation failure is going to come. So I think gathering the information is is one crucial part, but also being ready to deal with that information and understanding how you're going to help that client achieve their stated objectives is also crucial. Yeah, I think that I think that's about right. Um, amazingly, we only have about five minutes left, so we're we're going to focus very quickly on on the last thing I wanted to ask you. Um, and Neville, I'm going to come to you first. Um, so I want to talk about this notion of demand. And Jeannie, you hinted at uh, there'll be a generational thing where future generations, the world's going to look look totally different. But I want to I want to touch a little bit on what the actual demand uh, out there. Uh, from a uh, consumer perspective in particular, because again, when we conduct our, our regular omnibus uh, research with advisors, we're not seeing a huge uptick in them saying to us that their clients are coming to them to talk about you know, ESG or, or sustainable investing. And that's part of that is, is, is perhaps understandable because of you know, the lack of, of knowledge on a on a kind of mean average basis that the consumers have about the real practicalities of investing and, and what that means um is it going to be a generational thing where future generations this is just going to be on their agenda because that's the direction of travel do we need wider kind of populist driven stuff within within the media to to force through a a generational change because i'm thinking of things like i saw gary lineker tweeting the other day about um, you know, ESG investing within his pension fund. There's the Richard Curtis uh, initiative. I can't remember the make money better, make money more better. Can't remember making money matter. Um, so that's a kind of two or three questions in one there, Neville. But where do you see the real demand coming from in the in the future for this? Is it inevitable? <laughs> I think it is inevitable in the sense, having having been in this market for 23 something years, um, the question is almost, are we now seeing a point where it becomes a mainstream option? But then what does that look like? You know, how serious is it? How committed is it? Um, if it's all about greenwashing, then actually 
that doesn't mean very much. Um, but also, I, I think that it's it's being driven so hard by regulation, UK, international, European, that actually the entire industry is moving in a direction whether individuals are catching up or not. So fund managers are going to have to do more. Businesses are going to have to do more. Um, and it's almost the regulatory drivers, I think, that are that are determined probably with a focus on climate change. I think that is the main focus. But equally, you do get this urgent sense that, you know, the BBC programme, Blue Planet, completely shifted our analysis of plastic. It is possible to catalyze a movement simply by showing the devastation that is being wreaked on the natural world, for instance. That's so I think lots of things are coming together. I think lots of things are coming together. Um, but at the end of the day, consumers will do one thing and say another. You know, the consumers that may be aghast at Boohoo will still buy from Pretty Little Thing because they may not know that's owned by Boohoo. So we still have a lot of work to do. But I do think it's a generational shift. And, and you know, there is momentum in, in the education process. Younger people are really concerned about this. And we have to remember the millennials are not teenagers. They're hitting 30. They have capital and they will make important choices around where they place their capital for their future. Grant, that, that's really that's really interesting, Neville. Um, I think we've got time just to squeeze one last wee question in, and it comes from the gaffer, who a uh, really interesting question just came to me from a journal. Jeannie, I'm going to have to come to you. If a client tells a planner they want ESG and then the fund, uh, then the fund the firm has selected is found to be not all it's cracked up to be, are they opening themselves up for claims or false action, etc.? Um, well, I mean, assessment it made, no client in the world ever asked for an ESG portfolio. That's just not how clients talk. But um, yes, I think there is, I think there is an element of, of risk there. You have to do your research um, and it's not good enough just to go onto a research site and pick some stuff that's got the word sustainable in the title. You have to do better than that. Um, and you have to understand the holdings and you have to understand you have to have the conversation with the client. So as Neville said earlier, no no company is perfect. You you never know when the next thing is going to erupt. And, and yeah. no one no one can help that. Um, but as long as you've been clear with your client, they understand the type of companies that hold, you understand the process behind that fund, I think there's very limited risk there. Um, I think if the worst that would happen is you'd have a very disappointed client who would go elsewhere. Grand. All right. Thanks very much for that, Jeannie. Thank you, Neville. Um, we're just about hitting our maximum uh, 45 minutes. So the the one, the God, we could be talking here for, for hours, I think, uh, and not really scratch the surface on where we could get to. Uh, I hope it's been uh, interesting. Uh, uh, an alarming number of you have stayed for the, few, uh, for the, for the full duration uh, of today. So thank you very much for giving us another swing at it. Um, <laughs> the tech gods mainly smiled at us. They, we, we were in the green room, the virtual green room beforehand, and, and uh, Neville and I were saying how, how good technology has been working. And, and I think we tempted the, the technology gods um, a, a little bit there, but we came through in the end. Um, next week, uh, there's another guest uh, guest host. Uh, well, not really a guest. It's Mike Barrett from the Lancat. Uh, Mark is having a, another uh, rest next week because um, he's a lazy, lazy bad man and he's having another rest. Um, but Mike Barrett's going to be on with uh, Anthony Morrow uh, from Evester talking about the advice gap uh, and all things robo advice and, and interesting such stuff. Uh, thank you, a huge thank you to Jeannie and Neville for your patience and for giving us another go. Um, it's been a, hopefully a, a really interesting session. I know I've, I've enjoyed it and I've learned a ton of stuff in just 40 minutes. Uh, which is just super. Um, the only thing I would like to say uh, in addition, in closing, uh, and it's uh, a, a bit of a sombre note, I'm afraid, uh, is some of you might have seen uh, Mark's note uh, in the Top Class Wednesday update, uh, is that uh, just like to say, uh, reinforce uh, thoughts and condolences um, from everyone at the Lancat uh, to the family, friends and colleagues of Greg Kingston. Uh, this week we lost a real giant of the sector um, both in terms of uh, the work he's done, but also him as a uh, as a human being. Um, and you can see from the like output, like I don't want to be disingenuous and say that uh, Greg was a great friend of mine. Um, we were work acquaintances and we worked on a few projects and caught up every now and again. But it was clear um, from from everything that's been said about him in the sector, uh, what a great person uh, he was. And it's a real 
kind of cruel irony that um, we only really find out about this after after someone's gone and there's there's probably a lesson in there somewhere for for all of us so huge condolences uh, to to family and friends of Greg uh, from everybody at the Lancat. Um, once again thank you for uh, everybody for attending today and uh, we'll see you next week bye bye